Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So as you can see by the title today, we're gonna to be talking a little bit about commercial real estate. So if you don't know, I recently leased a space, um, a design studio for my brand, J. Keats and Designs, underneath my Created by Justice umbrella. And I just wanted to share with you guys today a little bit about the process of getting a retail space. So um, my design channel or my creator channel right now um, is now going to be focused on design, creativity, and the business side of design, which um, as a creative, a lot of times we don't get too much into that, but often as a creator, you have to be your own boss. You have to be, if you're a freelancer, you're pretty much a business owner. And so I really do want to tap into that business side of design and the creative arts industry um, on my YouTube channel from now on. So this is going to be one of our first videos about the business side. So if you're interested in leasing the space, whether it's for a design studio or a studio or just anything in retail or business, it could be a law firm or a medical office or something, then stick around. We're going to go through my process of leasing the space. Um, most of this process isn't even tailored directly towards being a creative um, enterprise, so you can apply it to most industries. So let's get started. I've broken it down into 10 steps that I feel like I went through in my process of getting a retail space. So I'm going to start with step one, which most people probably guess, which is the ideation stage. So you have an idea of, hmm, maybe I want to get a space. What would it be like if I had a physical location for whatever it is that I do, whatever my business is. And so you start thinking about like, what if... Um, like the what would I do you know what would it look like or whatever what do I need so just that idea like that brainstorming process so that is I would say step one that I went through and I initially started thinking about a retail space back in May so, uh, and this is of 2023 um, and I initially had a different idea of what I wanted for my retail space I wanted a bigger space that I could use as an event hall for like birthday parties and stuff initially and also do workshops and use it as like uh, my office and whatnot however I did end up scaling that down obviously because the space I have now is more of a studio it's, um, 900 square feet but yeah that's what I would say ideation is step one if you see me looking over here I'm just looking at my notes because I have it all written down so step two I would say is research so now that you have the idea kind of what you think that you want you need to start researching it so I use LoopNet um, I watched a video with this guy and he said to use LoopNet, Craigsy, and um, what was the other one? Craigslist. Craigsy and Craigslist just were not it for me. It just, no. I just couldn't get into it and it was nothing on there. Um, and I'm naturally paranoid, so Craigslist was just an absolute no for me. Craigsy kind of just had everything LoopNet had on there and I didn't feel like the interface was as so I just never really went back to that one very often but LoopNet had a lot and it had like where you can kind of search by the areas and at the bottom of the page like I was searching in areas like College Park, Cakeville, Decatur initially and then I started looking at spaces up north like Chambly, um, Sandy Springs you know up there I think I even looked places like Lithia Springs, which I really, I didn't want to go that far west or outside of the city because I really wanted to be in the city, like have that Metro Atlanta market um, and be really close to like Marta or whatever. But yeah, we'll get to that stuff. But researching your space. So that's what I use. I use LoopNet. So that's what I would go with. Um, you know, I wouldn't even bother with the other two because everything is pretty much on LoopNet. Another thing you can do, which I didn't really do, because um, at the time I was a flight attendant when I was looking around and stuff, so I didn't have a lot of time in my city. I was always traveling. But if you are stationary, then, is that the right word? I don't know if that's the right word. 
But if you're just in one location and you're here, you don't travel a lot for work or anything, drive around. Cause I honestly feel like I like my space where I am now. I'm really happy with, with it so far. But if I had, now that I had gone through the process of looking for a space, getting a space, everywhere I go, I see retail space, office space for this in little pockets where that it wasn't on movement. But there are just signs everywhere and there's some really, really cool spaces. And you also have businesses that are going out of business. Um, there's one out there in Decatur that I saw it's next to the waxing place that I go to. And when I tell you, if it had went out of business when I was looking for a space, I would have had to snatch it up because it was the perfect location for what I wanted at the time, what I was looking for. So this kind of leads me into my next point what I was looking for. You need to set parameters for what you want. And it's okay if it changes because mine changed. Um, so I initially wanted to be somewhere kind of like in a plaza with a lot of foot traffic, like near a grocery store. Um, that's really what I want. I want it to be near a grocery store. Um, and have like a storefront where it's like the glass and you can walk a strip, kind of like a plaza, but a little bit more high end, not really strip molly, flea markety but a little more like a shopping little plaza district type thing. That's really what I wanted. But I didn't necessarily get that. <laughs> I didn't get that at all, really. But I still am happy with my space and I'll tell you why later. So you also wanna look at things, obviously like the price range. Um, you wanna look at the size. So this goes into what do you wanna do in the space? So I, when I scaled down, I knew that I was only gonna really be focusing on doing the design space for me. I wanted a design studio where I could work and bring all my projects and all of my crafts and my equipment into the space, work on my designs, and have an office space. So I didn't need to be 2,500 feet like I did when I was looking for an event hall. So you can kind of use that to gauge how much space you're gonna need. You can also look up some stuff on Google and it'll give you a rough estimate for your type of business, your size of whatever you're doing, um, and what type of size space you would need. Also, you wanna look at the space type. So you have retail spaces, office spaces, medical office spaces, industrial, flex. Um, what else do we have? Just regular office space. So I was looking for either office, retail, or flex. So that's what I was looking into. And you know, with commercial real estate, it's a little bit more flexible. So don't, don't set hard parameters with that because you might find something in one of those other categories that works good for you. But it's also just something to consider. Okay, next step is contact the rep. So when you go on LoopNet, they're gonna have these for mostly like 75 to 80% of the time, they have a little document on there that shows you the specs. It shows you kind of like the surrounding area, the amenities. It's kind of like a, a kit to kind of sell you on the space. But they should always have the email and the phone number of the person who represents that space. So that way you don't really have to sign up for a LoopNet account. And they, well, they want you to sign up, and I think they have paid plans also, so that way you can get in contact with the rep of their site. But you don't want to do all that. Just, get, just download the little document and then just contact them from that document. So that's what I did. And then what you wanna to talk to the rep about, you wanna be very transparent with everything that you're trying to do, okay? So tell them what you're trying to do so they can give you a yes or a no. If they give you a yes, then you wanna go look at the space. And I only looked at this location inside. So I, I went to a few different places that I found on LoopNet and I looked the outside to see for one is, is there a parking um, where is it so there were spaces there was one over there where was it East Atlanta somewhere um, and it was a nice space but it had no parking and I knew that because I was going to host workshops I needed parking and I wanted it to be free I didn't want people to have a hassle of you know getting ticketed or anything like that so you want to get stuff like that so a lot of spaces I went I looked at the outside of it um, kind of peek through the window and kind of see what it was like. And often the spaces on LoopNet, unfortunately, will be outdated. So sometimes they've already leased it to somebody. But 
it doesn't hurt to call and try and figure it out. Um, so that's what happened. So the spaces that I toured were this space and I'm in an office park, which seems kind of crazy because I'm a designer and I have creative workshops, but we'll get to that. And I'll, I'll, we'll get to why it works so well. Um, I toured a space up a few buildings ahead of mine in the same office park. It was about 850 square feet. I decided to go with this one because this one already had a room with a door. And initially I wanted to, I wanted two rooms, but we kind of decided against that. And that's gonna lead me to my next point. So when you're talking with your rep, you're touring a space, okay? So you're moving along. You need to tell them exactly what your vision is. So my vision, I told them what I wanted. Initially, I wanted a space where I could do my woodworking in here. Um, and it didn't work out that way because the space didn't have enough ventilation. And I have neighbors. So the rep was cool with it. He was like, we can just put some, um, some soundproofing in the walls when we do the renovation. But it, it didn't have enough ventilation for the dust and stuff. So I was like, you know what, don't worry about it because the only woodworking I wanted to do in here would be so minimal, I could just continue doing it at home. So it wasn't a super big deal. And then with that, I no longer needed the extra room. So the one room was okay. I had them knock out a room here because I wanted a really big open space when you first walked in to be like the workshop room. Yeah, the workshop room. So that's what I wanted. So you tell them that. You tell them everything you want so that you can kind of figure out a plan and figure out what's feasible and what's not. They're there to help you figure out what you can and can't do. Um, and kind of talk about anything else you need to know. Like you ask them, okay, what's the process look like from here on out if I did want this space? You know, what's the rent? Because sometimes on LoopNet, they don't always tell you up front. Um, you know, is utilities included? Do you have things like tissue paper towels included? Um, you know, we'll ask those kinds of questions. Ask what do you need to do now? So I asked those questions and what he told me was, um, basically you do a background check. They check to make sure everything is good. Um, if it's good, then you just, you sign a contract, well you meet with a contractor. You find a contractor, you basically go through this process to tell them what you want, to, want done and then you pay the deposit. So, he made it seem really simple. We'll get back to that, because one thing he did not mention was like taxes or money or anything like that. So we're gonna get to that part. Okay, so step we're on four now is what I call tailoring. So, and I guess I kind of combine this with step three is where you get really, really specific about what you want. So like I mentioned before, we talked about the parameters that I was looking for for my space and what's feasible and what's not. And then you get even more specific. So like when I said, I want this wall knocked out. Initially, my wall to my office. We were gonna push it back to make this space bigger, but I was like, you know what, just leave it. Um, things like the color scheme. I wanted a trim, a color trim on all my doors. I want my walls painted a specific color, the floor a specific color. You get very specific about the things that you want. Um, and you start tailoring the space to your needs. And again, this is still a part of the, the discussion with your rep. He's gonna tell you what you can do, what you can't do, what the budget looks like for your tenant allowance, which is how much the owner is willing to pay for you to move into the space. So it's basically an allotment of money to renovate the space to your liking. And you kind of pay it back to them through your lease, basically. So it has to, and, and they have like um, a certain amount of this in the allowance allotted for each term pretty much. So I initially was gonna do a three year term, but what I wanted was a little bit out of the budget for what we could do. And I ended up going up to a five year term, which was okay with me. Cause I preferred to have something that was consistent and stable. Step five in my process, I kind of hit on this before. He had me do a background check. I think it was like $55 or something. And just, I guess, to make sure you're not a serial killer um, and that you pay your debts and stuff and there's nothing crazy on your credit report. So that's pretty much the screening process that I did for my step five. Okay, step six, y'all. Okay, this is pretty much step four all over again, but with a contractor. So you're gonna go through this with a contractor and be very, very specific. 
be specific about every single thing that you want. And I'm gonna do another video about things that, um, the pros, the cons, and things I wish I would've known because my relationship with my contractor was not very good. Um, I feel like I had a nightmare of a contractor, but whatever, it's neither here nor there. I'm deciding if I wanna do a video, um, almost like a beware to teach you what to do and what not to do when dealing with a contractor. But yeah, you basically do tailoring the step four of getting very specific about everything you want with a contractor. And they're gonna give you a quote. And that quote is gonna tell you whether you're within or outside of your tenant allowance. Now when you have a tenant allowance and you go outside of it, you're gonna be expected to pay money um, for whatever you want. Now I don't know, because I didn't go outside of mine, I don't know if they break that down into your lease or you have to pay it up front. I think it's really flexible and you negotiate it with your rep and the owners. But that's what happens. That didn't happen to me. I think I stayed within budget of, yeah, I definitely stayed within budget because they showed us the quote and my quote was about 13,000 something. Um, and honestly, it probably wasn't that much because like 2,000 of that, they had set aside for like, I guess, incidentals or miscellaneous or something. So you really shouldn't go outside of it. But my first contractor that we walked through with he was close to $20,000 for a quote. Now, I'm not gonna get too much into this because I'm doing another video on it, but let me just say you get what you pay for. So, I didn't have no idea of what a contractor was supposed to cost. I thought everything was just going up because of inflation, but I'm thinking maybe the quality represents the quantity that you pay. And because of the scope of what I wanted to do, that allowance we went up, like I said, from three years to five years. Okay, I'm gonna change my battery before my camera dies. Okay, I'm back. So, now we are at step seven. Man, this video is a lot longer than I thought it was gonna be. I was trying to talk fast, guys. All right, anyway. So, seven, step contract negotiation, right? So, I had asked for a draft of my lease of, or of what the lease would look like, a sample. And they have they had one that they pretty much is the same exact lease and they just make modifications to the, what do you call them things? I forgot what they're called. Um, something at the end of the contract. I forgot, I'd have to look it up. Maybe I'll type it on here somewhere. But yeah, so I was able to see exactly what the contract is gonna look like beforehand. So I had already asked for this and I don't remember when, but I had, I had been looking through it, reading through it, um, you know, just making sure nothing crazy was in there. And it wasn't. Um, I was pretty okay with it. The only thing that I had asked of them is to put in a subletting clause. So my contract has said something like subletting is not allowed um, unless you get permission. So me, I was like, I wanted to say subletting is allowed. I don't want it to say not allowed, I want to say it is allowed with certain approvals. Because if you say, or the way I was understanding it, if I wanted to sublet for a reason, because I do plan on going to get my MBA and I wanna go get it at NYU. So I do know at some point, if I'm not able to get my studio to run itself the way I want it to, um, which is gonna happen because I'm claiming it, but you know, just in case, I would sub, I would sublease the space. And so I knew that there was a possibility something like that might happen. So I wanted to be able to sublease the space, sublet the space, and because you never know money can get tight. Um, and I didn't want them to be able to immediately say no. So when you say it's not allowed, unless you get permission, that's basically, basically saying I can say no and I don't have to consider anything that you say. But when you say it is allowed, with certain stipulations, then it, I have more of a fighting chance to, you know, to do that and to say, okay, hey, the contract says I can do this, what are the parameters, and I'll work within those parameters versus being able to just flat out tell me no with no reason. So I just was very particular about that wording and wanting it to be that I can do X, Y, Z. So I was looking over the lease and um, 
it was the draft that I was looking at that wasn't mine, but it gave me an idea of what I wanted to ask for. And so I did get my lease. And so that's when I did tell them that's what I wanted. And it was kind of like a little bit of, a little soft negotiation. It wasn't really even real negotiating at that point. I was just like, okay, hey, I want this to say this. This is what I want. Um, and we were almost all good, but then they threw a little curveball at me. And I was mentioned, and this is what I was talking about before. So initially when I talked with the rep and I asked what the process looks like, they didn't ask anything about financials, which I thought was weird. I was like, oh, this is easy. They didn't even ask for any taxes or anything. But they did now at this point, after they've already sent me my official contract that I was supposed to sign. The only reason I didn't sign it was because I was trying to get that sublet in there. And so basically what, how it was explained to me is that the owner was a little bit nervous because my business is considered a startup because I just started it um, in 2022. Well, I, officially, I started it earlier than that, around like 2020, but it really formed and became an LLC and you know had a, a strong presence and foundation in 2022. So it's considered a startup. So what they wanted was to put me on a personal guarantee for five years at twenty thousand dollars. I was like, no, mm, no, I can't do that. Um, it's very important to me when signing a contract to not feel like feel like I'm making a deal with the devil. And when I say that, it's nothing personal to anybody because I like my rep. He's actually a really cool guy. He's really nice. Um, you know, thus far he seems like a very genuine person. So. I'm fortunate that that's the rep that I got and that I work with. So I'm not saying to deal with the devil with him, but just in general, the contract, a personal guarantee means that if you default for any reason, um, you're gonna owe them 20 grand. You're gonna owe them 20K. For five years, you're under that guarantee. And I was like, no, no, I can't do that. It's like, yeah, no, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, and so I was trying to figure out a way for it to work because I do understand from an owner's perspective um, that is a little bit of a risk. I mean, all business is a risk, all real estate is a risk, but I do understand that they want to mitigate that risk a little bit. And so I was like, okay, look, I can sign a personal guarantee for two years at 15000 because I said if it's considered a startup, most businesses fail within two years. So if I ain't failed by year two, month 24, then I think we should be in the clear. I think that's a, a safe to, I, I don't know, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I think it's a safe bet that I'll be all right. And basically I, I asked them to bring it down to 15,000 because I looked at the 20K for one, the renovations are 13K. And I looked at the 20K and some of the things that are listed in there are things that they were renovating no matter what. So when I was first looking at the space, it let me know, you know, you're, we're renovating all the floors. And so if floors are $4,000 and you're renovating all the floors, why are you putting $4,000 in my personal guarantee if you were gonna do it anyway? So that was kind of my thinking. And so I kind of looked at the numbers and was like, hmm, okay, let's lower this because you are gonna do this anyway. You're gonna make these renovations anyway. So I shouldn't have to pay for something you were gonna do anyway. If worse comes to worse. So I was, that's when I negotiated for um, subletting. It scared me a lot because the word default was not clearly defined, like nothing in a contract is ever straightforward. It's all like all fancy academic language. But um, it really scared me the idea of default because I'm like, if I die, I'm in default. You, what you're gonna do is gonna take all my assets from my family. You're gonna... That was concerning to me. So that is why I did want to put some of those other things in place, like subletting. So if I died, maybe my family can sublet the space so they don't have to pay that money. You know, if they choose to come after me, they could just write it off, but you never know. Um, so yeah, contract negotiation, personal guarantee. So this is the part where it almost didn't happen. So I almost let it go. And I was looking up, I didn't get to take my negotiations class when I was a business major. Uh, you know, just in case y'all didn't know, surprise, when I first went to USC, I was in Marshall. So I was a business major for almost two years. And then I switched into design, 
So I didn't get to take my negotiations class or my finance class, which I wish I would have. But I did some research online and I was like, what's the strongest position in negotiation? They said the strongest position in negotiation is the ability to say I walk away and mean it. And um, so I had to kind of come to terms with the fact that it might not happen. I might not get my space and it was going to have to be okay. And so I'm really good at finding like different plans and different ways to get to my goal other than the way that I initially thought that I would do it. And so I was like, well, you know, if I can get my space now, maybe I'll do mobile workshops. So the workshops I do now, maybe I'll just go to other, go to people. So that way I could do everything from home or get like a little $200 storage unit um, and, and kind of work like that. And so, you know, I started making plans for that. And it's still a part of my business model today to do the mobile workshops. I never would have thought about that if I wasn't put in that position. But, you know, basically what I'm trying to say is you have to be okay with being able to walk away. And I had devised a plan where I could still get to my goals, still do the things that I want to do, still make almost as much money as I can make with my space um, by developing this contingency plan. And so I really was willing to walk away. Um, and so I was really just thinking about it, giving it time. I think what kind of happened was maybe they had a deadline that they were supposed to get everything signed by. Because I didn't actually say anything. I was going to, when I suggested the proposal of everything I told you about bringing down the guarantee and all of that, he didn't reject it, but he definitely didn't go for it the first time. <laughs> And so I was giving it some thought and I was, I was gonna say, I don't, I'm not quite sure if I could do this thing because I can't do that. I don't feel comfortable with that. Um, we might have to just, you know, dead it. But he ended up coming back at like out the blue and was like, uh, okay, I got the owner to agree. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, let me add something else into the negotiations. Um, my aunt, is a lawyer but she's not a um, commercial real estate lawyer but she i think she does i have to look at what it is there's so many types of lawyers man but i basically asked her to look at my contract and ask for some advice and, and whatnot and she was like you know the personal guarantee is nothing out of the ordinary it's nothing that there is going on it's pretty standard especially for a startup <laughs> startup but she was like in commercial real estate, you can negotiate. So, you know, you can do that. It's flexible and it's what they're willing to give and what you're willing to give and how you guys come together and decide on whatever it is. You know, it's not like a residential agreement. So that worked out in my favor. I, I put out that proposal. The worst they could say is no. And the worst that could happen was that I just dunk in my face, which if I didn't get it, I was gonna live. God willing. But yeah, I ended up getting it. They ended up coming back and saying, you know what, okay, the owner agrees with the two year guarantee for XYZ, subletting clause, and all of that good stuff. All right, so at that point, when you sign a contract, the work is supposed to begin. Okay. I'm gonna have to do this video on my nightmare contractor experience. Okay, the work is supposed to begin. Um, and all the reason I say it's supposed to begin is because I was told that the work will begin when the contract was signed. But that is tea for another video. Anyway, um, so once you sign the contract, the work starts, they start working on the space because, oh, no. You sign the contract and you get the deposit. You get the first month's rent and the security deposit. That also is something that goes toward, I believe, your tenant allowance so they're not completely footing thirteen thousand dollars because you're giving them a little bit of money to offset that cost with your first and second not second but your first and um security deposit by the way in negotiations i offered an extra month's rent up front and apparently in georgia you can't do that so that's why they said no to that um but yeah that goes in back to step eight the work begins to start working on the space now me I, what I wanted to do was pop in and videotape a little bit, and I did get to do that, so you guys will see that video of the space going from 
you know, what it looked like before when the last people were here and it had like the super old carpets, the, just, you know, it looked like something that was from probably early 2000s, cause it probably was, but yeah. So I have that video and kind of with the space transforming. Eventually the work gets done. And then you get to step nine where you move in. So I grossly underestimated the amount of work, labor and effort that goes into this process. It takes so long. I'm not even done moving in. Honestly, I still have stuff to buy, lots of furnishing. And so I've decided I'm gonna give myself the whole year to perfect everything in my studio. So I'm gonna take one whole year to get absolutely everything that I want. Because I don't have the funds to just buy everything that I want in my studio right now. So moving in, I'm actually gonna just take this whole year to slowly build up everything that I want in my studio and the ambiance and all the design and the furniture and everything. But to get started, um, you know, step nine, you move in, I brought my tables, chairs, um, Cricket. I haven't brought the sewing machine yet because I need to get the locks. I want to get special locks on my door with um, like a little key code and security and stuff like that because my sewing machine was expensive and I was pissed off if it gets stolen, which is a really safe area over here, but you never know. So that's the move-in process. I moved in, like I said, on November 2nd, uh, supposed to be November 1st. And yeah, so your move-in process, I would say, with contractors, you probably, I don't think it's uncommon to not be on time. I don't think that that's uncommon, but I would say stay on top of it and make sure, you, just make sure you stay on top of it because I eventually had to, I had to bring my rep into everything. I, at a certain point, I really just didn't like talking to the contractor because he was so nasty. So I would bring my rep into anything. Um, and so when, when white men are dealing with white men, for some reason, they tighten up. So I'm like, you can deal with him. Because for some reason, he's not respectful when he talks to me. So you can deal with him. Because anytime my rep dealt with him, I guess because he puts money in his pocket, everything seems to get cleared up. You know, and there are no issues. So that, they wrap up all of that good stuff. And then step number 10, you start making money. For me, I do workshops and I do... I work in my office and I work on my contracts and whatnot. Sometimes I work on my contracts at home. But the office makes me so much more productive. So much more productive. Um, and then with the workshops, it gives me an opportunity to invite people into the space and make use of all of these tools that I have. I have a lot of stuff and like crafts um, from when I thought I wanted to do a t-shirt company, um, soap making, I just love soap making as a hobby. I don't think I ever really fully invested into doing it as a full-time business, but I don't do it every day. So I have a 25 pound block of soap and I'm like, it just sits there because I only do it like maybe once a month, if that, host some workshops. So that's really what I focused a lot of my energy on, doing my workshops, bringing people in here and making some money for the space. So that is step 10, make some money. All right guys, that is all I have for this video today. It was super long. I was thinking this video would be like 10 minutes. It wasn't, but I hope that it gave you a lot of good information about the process and more specifically my process um, for this video. And I hope maybe a little bit of that personal touch kind of helps you, um, I don't know, not make some of the same mistakes or just, you know, do certain things smarter than I did <laughs> but yeah that's all I have for you today that was the process of getting a retail space here um, it honestly it was pretty easy the process of getting it was pretty easy for me um, I ended up not having to provide any taxes or business plan or anything it's not because I was trying to be sleazy or anything I just didn't have the taxes because I, didn't, I started my company technically was less than a year ago, so I didn't have any taxes. Um, and my business plan, I could have provided it, but eventually 
when I was working on it, he came back and he was like, you know, owner agreed. So I didn't need to, didn't need to do that. I didn't need to put any extra work on myself. Um, but yeah, it's actually pretty simple. It's a really flexible process. And if you're looking into getting a space, um, I wish you all the best. Feel free to drop any questions you have below and then I can, you know, try to answer what I can. And if not, I might just ask my rep or somebody um, and maybe they can give me an answer that can help you. All right, so if you like this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and send this video to someone who might like it or benefit from it. All righty, bye.